of total war against public enemy number one in the United States, the problem of dangerous drugs. In 1970, 1971, we have Nixon declaring war on drugs. Nixon comes up with this idea of the no-knock raid. Federal narcotics officers across the entire country, they use it gladly and often. They start conducting these mass raids, sometimes without warrants, terrorizing people, giving them wrong houses. SWAT teams are spreading across the country, but they're still being used only in these emergency type situations. It really isn't until the Reagan administration that the two trends converge. We can defeat this enemy. Reagan had taken Nixon's drug war metaphor and made it very literal. 37 federal agencies are working together in a vigorous national effort. And by next year, our spending for drug law enforcement will have more than tripled from its 1981 levels start to see SWAT teams used primarily to serve search warrants on people suspected of drug crimes. The war on drugs federally has produced a lot of money that's then trickled down to communities. You see this heavy degree of new tools and weapons and things being given to police officers, but the outcome of that is that you change from the blue-shirted police officer to the battle-hardened, battle-gear-laden police officer who looks more like a military officer ready to fight against an enemy. The use of paramilitary policing tactics is not new. And in fact, in some communities, in particular poor communities of color, it's been going on for decades. <laughs> Particularly for people who are disproportionately affected by these policies, there's an increased tension that's going to build up. And um, a lot of times that can only hit its climax and result in extra violence that otherwise wouldn't be there. Introducing aggressive tactics and militarized tactics and weapons into an already volatile situation has a tendency to increase that cycle where the community becomes more tense and tends to react more violently. So the police react more violently against them and it's a self-perpetuating circle. In the 1990s, Congress created a program that's administered by the Defense Department that we refer to as the 1033 program. And this is a program that authorizes the U.S. military to give away to police departments military equipment, essentially free of charge, um, to the local police departments. And that program has a built-in requirement that a police department that receives equipment from the U.S. military has to use it within one year. Police officers are receiving military vehicles and uniforms and weapons and equipment and they're being told they're fighting a war on drugs, they're being told they're fighting a war on terror. And when you dress them up and you give them that mandate and you give them that mindset, it's not a surprise that they start acting in a militaristic way. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And it stands to reason that if the federal government is giving police departments an arsenal of military weaponry, they're going to use it. Tragically, there are so many incidents of the use of deadly force across the country. What we see is just this massive, massive increase in the use and number of SWAT teams. In the late 70s, there were a few hundred SWAT raids per year across the entire country. By the early 80s, we were up to about 3,000 per year. And by 2005, we we're up to about 50,000 SWAT raids per year. So you're looking at a, about a 1,500% increase since the early 80s and a 15,000% increase since the late 1970s. The vast, vast majority of that increase is not because we have had a massive increase in hostage takings or active shooter situations. In fact, violent crime is down quite a bit. It's because you started using these tactics as an investigative tool to serve search warrants to collect evidence against people suspected of drug crimes. There are certainly cases in which it's not only appropriate, but absolutely necessary for the police to use some form of paramilitary weapons and tactics like hostage, barricade, and active shooter scenarios. But there needs to be proportionality. We've really come a long way, and it's happened very gradually, which is why I think people haven't noticed and why I think there's never really been you know, any sort of public debate or public discussion about this. You know, there was never, Congress never said we're going to vote tomorrow on whether or not we should militarize police, right? It, it's been a 
an amalgamation of policies that have had this kind of gradual uh, eroding effect on these principles uh, that got us where we are today. Um, I was uh, elected county sheriff of Davis County in 1974. On the 22nd of September 2008, the very SWAT team that I founded in the 1970s killed my son-in-law in my presence as I defended them to his father and his mother and my children, promising them that these men were trained and professional and knew what they were doing. It does not appear that the police are going to change unless they are shown that this is an error. This is wrong. I'm going to inform people wherever I can, however I can, and by whatever media I can. So I sit here having gone the full gamut. I'm telling you we're on the wrong track. We need to go back and restore some of what was intended in that doctrine that we hold so sacred as our Constitution. I don't think mankind is equipped to tolerate injustice forever. Somehow, if we can have some kind of closure, some kind of, hopefully we can be big enough to forgive. Hopefully the truth can cut its way to the surface. It is the conclusion of the Salt Lake County DA's office that the shooting that resulted in the death of Daniel Willard on November 2, 2012, by Detective Kevin Salmon and Sean Tully was not justified. done today is open the door. We just opened the door so that our case can be heard in a court of law. It seems to be the only avenue that I have that I can speak out and say, this is wrong. How do you get their attention? If you don't sue them. I wouldn't really say Utah is unique, at least not that I've noticed. You know, the one thing I have noticed about Utah that I think is definitely different is that there does seem to be some mounting opposition to this, the organized opposition even. I have been silent for almost five years. I would like to lend my support and begin speaking publicly to bring about some changes 